Welcome to church. One of the greatest privileges of my life is that for 25 years, I've been part of the local church. Does she still take your breath away? We are gonna be going through Song of Songs and you're gonna hear words like beloved, beautiful, darling, fragrance, incense, gardens. That is the love of a God who so deeply wants to know you. Tonight, let's worship the God of heaven who says, does my bride still take your breath away?
So good morning 3CI and good morning The Rock in Durban. It's actually Valentine's Day. Well, it's not now, but when you're going to watch this, it's Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. Well, I don't know really what that means, but happy Valentine's Day. And uh, we've been trying to do these sermons in honor of certain people. Today, I want to honor somebody at The Rock Church, George and Michelle Carpenter, uh, 16 years of sitting behind a camera filming Angus Buchan. And uh, you feel your time is to move on and to go to England. I had the privilege of marrying you. It's heroes like you that um, just serve in the background, do incredible work. Hundreds of trips to Greytown, traveling all over the world to help Angus and his ministry. And Angus's ministry in Pretoria is highly, highly, highly valued. Changed many lives, many families, many inheritances. So George and Michelle, in honor of you, thank you so much. Thank you for the privilege of marrying you. And well done, young man, for keeping your vows and treating your bride as well as you've treated the bride of Christ. I honor you as we do the Song of Solomon, and I want to commend every one of you to fall deeply in love with Jesus. There's an incredible song that we sing from nursery school and from, from uh, Sunday school, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The Song of Solomon is one of the greatest healing books in the whole Bible. The greatest pain that comes to us as people is through relationships either through lovers or through parent and child relationship, boss and employee relationship, uh, uncles, cousins, fathers, grandpas, or teachers, students. There are all sorts of relationships that cause us the deepest pain. The most important relationship in the world is the one between Jesus and you. And this is a book with his sustained, consistent affection and passion for you. And so people have got different understandings of the book of Song of Solomon. Some say it's God and Israel. Some say it's the church and Jesus. Some say it's a married couple. Uh, some say it's Jesus and individual believers. And I say yes. And uh, people say yes what? It's, it's all of those. But um, so, so the word of God is unbelievably diverse and unbelievably deep. I think Song of Solomon is a menu. And you don't go to the restaurant to study the menu. You actually go to the restaurant for the meal. And so on this menu, it just says, I am the Rose of Sharon. That's not the meal. That's just the menu. And you've got to look at it. You've got to order it. You've got to wait for it. And then you've got to eat it. And if you take this book, single ladies, lonely people, successful people, if you take this book, right now you can be healed in the name of Jesus. And so I think if you look at Psalm 2, we don't have time to look there. But if we read Psalm 2, you would find three words. Jesus gets his inheritance from the Father. He says, ask of me, I'll give the nations to you as an inheritance. And then he uses three words. Terrifying, rejoicing, and kissing. And God is all three of those. And when we have a relationship with God, we have to know he's all three. In the book of Revelation, he's terrifying. The Bible says his hair is white and his eyes are like fire. That's scary. He's king and judge and that's frightening. But we need that aspect of God. In the book of Romans, we just rejoice because he's done everything. I'm justified by faith. I am righteous in Christ. I don't have to do anything. And so my whole life when I read Romans is just rejoicing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians is just rejoicing. I'm adopted as his son. I have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Song of Solomon is kissing. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Now, now for all you boors in... Um, Pretoria, muni bang vies ni. I don't think we're going to get to heaven and Jesus is going to kiss me. I don't really dig that too much. It's like, you know, it's like, um, I, I'm not quite sure it's like on um, Genome um, I'm not quite sure how he's going to do it, but I'm hoping Jesus is going to give me a high five. It's like, hey, Rory, welcome. And I'm going to be terrified. I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to kiss him, but with like of my hands. Or sort of a side hug, but I, just the thought of Jesus kissing me is just sort of like, <laughs> Don't dig that too much. And you see these pictures of Song of Solomon, they, they sort of make me a little bit... But he was a carpenter, so when he shakes your hand, um, Mr. Boor, he's going to squeeze it. He's going he's, he's gonna, to he's gonna look into your eyes and he's going he's, he's gonna, to he's gonna intimately embrace you into heaven. And so we don't really like intimacy. Uh, the best way to describe intimacy is, into me you see. 
And um, we, we, we sort of live at distance around relationships. And um, this is a horrible analogy, especially for single people here, but if you've been hurt, or if you've been hurt by the church, or you've been hurt in business or relationships or in family, it's like you put a condom over your heart. And so you sort of have interaction, but there's never an impregnation that takes place. And there's so many people in the church like that. There's so many relationships like that, where people are sort of, they're there, but they're not there. They've got this protective mechanism around their hearts, and the Song of Solomon is taking that mechanism off and being intimate with Christ. Amen? And so this book was celebrated at Passover. Passover was the time when they came out of Egypt, out of bondage, into freedom. And so it's actually a book about freedom. And um, most of the analogy is either garden or perfume. So if you want to read the Song of Solomon and learn from the Song of Solomon, buy some perfume and just spray it. Close your eyes, because the whole book is filled with fragrance, and with henna, and with incense, and with smell. And God has given us five senses, and we've got to love Him with all of them. Touch, taste, smell. Can I smell God? Can I, can I feel the fragrance of Jesus? I want to give this to a beautiful young lady, Sarah. We had a 21st this week. Happy birthday, young lady. Bless you. That bottle says beautiful. It's a prophetic sign. You're a beautiful girl. This book takes place in a garden, friends. In Genesis, so the whole book is kind of written in this garden language, browsing amongst the lilies. And so when you see these things with the fragrance around, you've got to go back to Genesis and say, what did God actually intend? And God actually intended for us to live naked and unashamed with people. Now what we do, because we're embarrassed, we build up all these barriers. We live behind closed walls. We lock our doors at night. We highlight privacy. We build different kind of layers. We have people who dress us. If you're a little bit overweight, you dress with stripes because we're so embarrassed to reveal ourselves, our true selves. And so we have all these psychological, physical, sexual barriers that prevent us from actually being vulnerable with anybody. And this book actually gives us an opportunity to be vulnerable with Christ, which will create a garden environment where we can trust and touch the depths of God's heart. And He can do the same with us. You see, if you build an indigenous garden, there are 49 words in Song of Solomon that don't appear in any other book in the Bible. 49 words. So it's a closed garden. You see, if you want relationships to operate in a garden, you have to have a language, and there is no negative language in Song of Solomon. You have to have a language that is uplifting. There is absolutely no comparison between bodies in Song of Solomon. There is no body shaming in Song of Solomon. It says your waist is like a bundle of wheat. Your navel is like a goblet filled with wine. Your teeth are like, like a flock of goats. He brings absolutely no shame to the woman's body at all. And so if you want your marriage to live in a garden, you have to decide the language that you're going to use that keeps that in the garden, that keeps it naked and unashamed. Because if you use any other language, it's like planting alien plants into your garden. It's like wattles and weeds coming in there. It's there 15 different locations, geographical locations in Song of Solomon. 15. I have about... 10 or 12 geographical locations. One of them is 3CI. One of them is my marriage. One of them is my family. One of them is my larger family. One of them is the school that my son goes to. One of them is the group of friends that I went to school with. And I have these geographical locations. And I've got the opportunity to change every one of those geographical locations into a garden or the book of Genesis ends in a coffin or into a coffin. And we have got coffins all over Pretoria, all over Durban, and namely, number one, because of our language. And so you have to read the Song of Solomon and say, God, will you change my language to garden language and away from grave language? Every broken relationship I have has been caused by my tongue. You see, friends, if you plant an indigenous garden, it attracts two things, birds and bees. Bees pollinate, and birds take the seed away. And so when you attract birds and bees, you create honey, pollination, and reproduction. 
So we ask ourselves, are we going to build a garden in Pretoria and a garden at the Rock Church, and we're going to extend that garden, or are we going to allow graves to come in and take over our relationships? Interesting. So this is what it says. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Uh, let the king bring me into his chambers. We rejoice and delight in you. We praise your love more than wine. How right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely. Say that with me. Dark am I, yet lovely. I, I would describe myself as a complex genius. I'm like about 30% genius and about 70% complex. I would describe myself as clever and dumb. This lady describes herself as dark and lovely. She's got a, she's got a conscience. She, she's saying... There are parts of me that are lovely and there are parts of me that are dark. How can anybody love me? I've got this history. I've got these shadows. I've got this darkness. I've got this streak. I've got this complexity. But I'm also lovely. C can you kind of like, how do, how do we put that all together? O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the ten curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark. Why do people look at me? Because I'm funny? Because I'm fat? Because I failed? Because I caused the, because people know that I sinned? Because I committed adultery? Why, why do people stare at me? Why, why, why are they all looking at me? When I walk through Pretoria, when I walk through Devon, why do people stare at me? My mother's sons were angry with me. My own brothers. Some of the greatest hurt that takes place is in the church. My brothers and sisters were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I have neglected. So she's got darkness in her heart, she's been rejected by her brothers, and she's neglected her own life. Dark, rejected, and neglected. Unlovable. You know what Jesus says? He says, come to my table. He brought me to the banqueting table. We sang that song many years ago. He brought me to the banqueting table. He brought me to the banqueting table. And his banner, yes, his banner over me was love. I don't have a good voice. Song of Solomon says, my voice is beautiful and my face is beautiful. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. He says, my voice is beautiful. And my face is beautiful. My voice is sweet and my face is beautiful. He brought me to his banqueting table and his banner over me is love. You can read it in verse 12. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. The first thing he says in verse 15, how beautiful you are, my darling. Say that, how beautiful you are. How beautiful you are. My, darling. my darling. Say how beautiful you are. How beautiful you are. My darling. For you lonely ladies sitting watching this on Valentine's Day, I say to you, how beautiful you are, my darling. She says, I'm dark. She says, I'm rejected. She says, I'm neglected. And Jesus says, you come to my table and the first thing I'm going to say to you, you're beautiful, my darling. I went to dinner this week. I think after last week, people were worried about me. So I got invited to dinner and we sat down at this dinner table with this couple and if you Durban boys think you can bri, keep surfing. <laughs> in Durban you surf for fun, in Pretoria we bri for fun. And we did this bri, well, we didn't, I got invited, and they did this fillet and they did this chicken. And when I sat down, it was, like, it was like fit for a king. I said to the hostess, thank you for this. There were mulberries in the salad and mango, and there were nuts inside of the salad, and there was fillet, and there were two different sauces. And, and, I, and I just looked, I thought, this is fit for a king. And I thought, but, but that's exactly what happens here. He takes this woman that seems to be neglected, and the first thing he does is he invites her to the banqueting table. Look what she says in chapter 2. I am, say I am, I am. A, rose of a rose of Sharon. That's all she says. I'm not neglected anymore. I'm not dark anymore. I am a rose of Sharon. 
Friends, if you don't understand that, your ego needs will place demands upon your friend that are absolutely impossible to satisfy. You see, you know the story, some of you. I married a girl called Sharon one day. I didn't marry her, I did her wedding. And she got divorced. And she went through a really difficult time. She was rejected by a man. She was neglected and neglected even her own heart. And then she decided to go on a Christian mission trip. And while she was going, they were praying for her home group. Her home group leader, Les Redmond, I'll never forget it. She said, Sharon, I see a man give you a yellow rose and say to you, you are the rose of Sharon. And she thought, ah. And she went to Brazil, and she went to a church meeting in Brazil, and then she had to fly from Brazil to Los Angeles to another church meeting, and she got on, and a Portuguese man sat next to her, and he put his briefcase above, he was all smartly dressed, and she looked at him, and he tried to talk to her in Portuguese, and she says, no, I don't understand. And he took his briefcase out, and he opened his briefcase, and inside his briefcase was a yellow rose, and on it was Song of Solomon chapter 2 in Portuguese, En Su, a rose de Saron. He gave it to you. If you're sitting by yourself on on Valentine's Day, I want to say to you, say this after me. I am. am. Say it with me. I am. am. The Rose of Sharon. Sharon. I'm not dark. I'm not neglected. I'm not rejected. I am the Rose of Sharon. Amen? And then we see this incredible thing. It says, Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. This book has got one of the most descriptive understandings of Christ. I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. He has taken me to the banquet hall and his banner over me is love. Strengthen me with raisins. Refresh me with apples for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. Woohoo! Why doesn't it say peach tree? Why doesn't it say mango tree? Why doesn't it say pine tree? Why does it say apple tree? We've got to go back to the Garden of Eden and realize that the thing that caused the curse was the apple tree. You see, in chapter 1, her brothers exposed her to sun. In chapter 2, Jesus covers her with shade. You see, we love to say, don't throw shade over me. We need shade thrown over us. The shade of the apple tree. She sat down in the shade of the tree that was meant to be a curse. Jesus reversed the curse and turned it into a blessing. He says, in that shade, I eat your fruit. I sit under the shade of his cross and I eat forgiveness. I eat acceptance. I eat righteousness. I don't labor for it. I don't run for it. I don't do push-ups for it. I don't do sit-ups for it. I don't earn money for it. I just sit in the shade of the apple tree. He's reversed the curse. Say reverse the curse. He has reversed the curse. And I sit in the shade of the apple tree. I sit at his table and receive his banquet. I sit in the shade of his apple tree. And you think Christianity is awesome. Then the next verse says this. Listen my lover. Look here he comes bounding over the mountains. Leaping over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. There he stands behind the window. Peering through the lattice. My lover spoke to me and he said. Arise my darling. My beautiful one. Say my beautiful one. Say my darling. But you see, Jesus doesn't want me to just sit in the shade. He wants me to come on an adventure. A mountain in the Bible is the obstacle of my life. Jesus runs down the greatest obstacle of my life. Jesus runs down it and he invites me into an adventure, but she's too scared to go. She says, no, I'm not going. He says, come with me. He says, no, I'm not going. We can't just sit at his table and enjoy all the benefits of Christianity, roast lamb and fillets and and, and walnuts and and, and raspberries and mango. We can't just enjoy that, which gives us the identity to be strong. We can't just sit in the shade of his cross and enjoy forgiveness. He wants us to do something. He wants us to come an adventure, not based out of fear, but based out of love. He says, my beautiful one, my darling, please come with me. And she says, no. And so he turns away and he leaves. 
And then she's lying in bed at night and she tosses and turns in her bed. She's saying, I'm lying in bed. And, and, and I realize that actually the worth of my life is to be with Jesus. I, and, and I don't know what to do. I'm restless. And then it says, she gets off her bed. You see, friends, Jesus wants us to actually stand up. He wants us to get off our bed. He wants us to stop sitting down. Obviously, we have to sit down to get our identity, but then we stand up and we go finding Jesus. We, and, and, and we have this sort of game the whole way through between, between finding and losing Jesus and finding and losing him, and we have this passionate relationship with him. And then she finds him, and when she finds him, she says, I grabbed him, and I wouldn't let him go. And then two amazing things happen. You can read it in, in, in chapter 3, in verse 2, it says, Look, it is Solomon's carriage escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. Say the terrors of the night. The terrors of the night. How many of you battle with fear? Put, put your hands up. How many of you battle with America right now? How many of you battle with COVID? How many of you battle with South Africa? How many of you battle with the ANC government? You see, when she panics, Jesus comes in a chariot with 60 armed guards and says, do not be afraid. You see, she was insecure. She loved him. She wanted to be with him, but she was afraid whether he could take care of her. So the first thing he says is, listen, I'm armed to the teeth. Don't be scared, Rock Church. Don't be strong, don't be scared, Three Seal. I'm looking over the camera at a massive building project. Am I scared? I can't be because I have a revelation of Jesus. I have a revelation. I've got a mountain to climb. I am deeply in love with you, Jesus. I am the rose of Sharon. I know that I am your darling God. He says, I'm strong. I have not given you the spirit of fear. I've given you a sound mind. You will not be in bondage. I've given you the spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. And then he does the most amazing thing. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Friends, speak words of life over your wives. Speak words of life over your staff. Speak words of life over your friends. And then he closes with this in this little He says, oh, verse 7, oh, beautiful you are, my darling. Say, my darling. My darling. He's talking to you, Biesbur. He's talking to you, Rory Dyer. Triple A convert. He, he loves me. He says, there is no flaw in you. You see, it's very easy for us to prophesy into the past of people. It's not that easy for us to prophesy into the future of people. And what Jesus does when his bride is insecure, he says two things. I'm going to show you how strong I am, and I'm going to start to speak to you about your future. I'm not going to find a flaw in you. I'm going to start to speak to you about the end days. There is no flaw in you. It says in chapter 6, you are completely unique, and it says, you are my dove and you are perfect. You know, friends, we are building the church with Song of Solomon men. One is called Ferdy, one is called Michael. If you go into the women's toilets of our building, there are 18 toilets in the women's section. 18 toilets, every single one of them painted a different color, and all of them built to the roof. And if you say to Ferdy and Michael, why do you do that? He said, because the women in our church are unique. And we respect the privacy of the women in our church. And so we built these toilets to honor the woman in our church. There is no flaw in you. Melanie, do you have flaws? Yes, but I'm going to love you like Jesus loved the church. There is no flaw in you. When I came to Pretoria, I got a second chance to love the church. I don't think in all my eight years in Pretoria, I don't think I've ever said a negative thing about 3CR Church. I love 3CR Church. Is it a perfect church? No, it's not. But Jesus says you must love her perfectly. We don't compare the worship of 3CR to to the church down the road. We don't compare the preaching because we never do. It says your, your waist is like a bundle. Your, your worship is beautiful, 3CI. Your building is beautiful, 3CI. Your building is beautiful, the Rock Church. Your building is beautiful. Your worship is beautiful. Your home group leaders are beautiful. There is no flaw in your home group leaders. Really? Well, no, it's not really. But I love them like that. They feel that. You see, we've got architects and engineers and apostles. We, we, we call to find the fault all the time. Jesus says, I'm going to find your future. Amen? You with me, friends? 
Imagine if we lived and worked in places where we found no flaw in people. It goes on, she starts to, it starts to trust him. And it says this for time's sake in, in chapter 4, in verse 16. It says, Awake, north wind, and come, south wind, for you Durbanites, I know you surfing dudes, you, you wake up and you think, I hope the southwest is blowing because then we can like catch a wave. And if the northeast is blowing, it's like, no, we can't catch a wave. We're going to like go and tune at the coffee shops. So there are two winds. There's the, there's the southwester and there's the northeaster in Durban. And the surfers are happy. Do you know what's happened to this young lady? She trusts Jesus enough that if it's a cold wind or a hot wind, she knows he's going to do her good. I haven't enjoyed the wind of this time. I haven't enjoyed it. The wind of COVID, the economic winds that have blown, the shutdowns that have happened, I haven't enjoyed it. But most people who are listening to me preaching saying there's something different about you, Rory. I found Christ in Lamentations. I found Christ in the Song of Songs. I found Christ in the book of Ecclesiastes. And at times it feels like the wind is very cold. I saw one of my friends who lost his stepdad, Jochen. I saw him in a car park. I haven't even had the energy to phone him. I feel like I've completely failed him. It just feels like the wind is just, it's just so icy cold. But listen to what she says. Awake north wind and come south wind. Blow on my garden. Say my garden. My garden. So everything is my. And then she says, that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden. Say his garden. His garden. See, changes. It's my garden. It's his garden. Say, Jesus, will you blow on me? North wind, south wind. And whatever comes out of me, Jesus, will you come and enjoy the fruits of my life? She's inviting Jesus into her personal space. It's an incredible picture. And then he goes and says, my garden, my sister, my bride, my myrrh, my spice, my honeycomb, my honey, my wine, my milk. And then he knocks on the door. This is an amazing story, this. She knocks on the door and says, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. <laughs> Close your eyes. You're watching TV right now. Close your eyes. Listen to this. Listen, my lover is knocking open to me. My sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. I've taken off my robe, must I put it on again? It's a bit inconvenient, Jesus, right now. Ready, ready for bed. I've washed my feet, must I soil them again? My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I rose to open for my lover. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. He's playing like cat and mouse. Where is your priority? Where is your love? I, I, I want you to chase me. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called to him, but he did not answer. Say, did not answer. Yeah. One of the greatest reasons why people do not serve Jesus is because he does not answer their prayers. If you're in love with Jesus, you will push through. Right now, people are saying to me, why did God not heal? Why did God not save? I don't know. But follow this bride. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me and they bruised me and they took away my cloak. Those watchmen of the walls. O daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I'm faint with love. The two greatest reasons why people stop serving Jesus is because of unanswered prayer and because they got beaten and bruised in the church. And it has no effect on this woman. None whatsoever. She says, when you find Jesus, tell him I'm lovesick. Don't tell him I'm disappointed. Don't tell him I'm neglected. Don't tell him I'm rejected. Don't tell him I'm dark. Don't tell him that the leaders have taken, bruised me. Just tell him I'm deeply in love with him. 
And she goes on to tell one of the most incredible stories about Jesus. My lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is pure as gold. His hair is wavy and black. In Revelation, his hair is white. In Song of Solomon, his hair is black. You do not give Jesus gray hairs. With all the stress that I call Christ, he does not have one gray hair in the Song of Solomon. Whether I follow him, don't follow him, climb the mountain, don't climb the mountain, my stress doesn't affect him. His hair is black in the Song of Solomon and his hair is white in Revelation. In Revelation, I fear him. In Song of Solomon, I absolutely ravish him. You are beautiful. You are radiant. You are ruddy. It doesn't matter if you don't answer my prayers. It doesn't matter if people beat me up. I'm after you, Jesus. And then he says this, here comes my bride. She is like an army with conquering banners. She's won a victory. She started to mature. And then he says this, turn your eyes for me, for they overwhelm me. There's only one thing in the whole world that can conquer Christ, and that's the eyes of his bride. I want Jesus to see such a depth of love and devotion in my eyes that he has to turn away. He thinks Rory's starting to mature. Rory's starting to let different winds blow over his life. Rory's starting to understand my security. Rory's starting to understand his future. 3CI is starting to walk in an inheritance. The Rock Church is walking in an inheritance. We realize actually we can change our language. For time's sake. In chapter 7 it says, How beautiful are your sandaled feet. You see, she didn't want to come with him. Because she was a little bit immature and she didn't really like rough roads. But by the end of the book she's got a pair of shoes on. And she's ready to go on a journey with Jesus. Then he picks up there many things. But one of the things he says, your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon. Heshbon was a mining town that had these deep resources. And once they'd finished mining, they filled up with water. And if you Google Heshbon, you'll just see ponds full of fish. She's so in love with Jesus, this bride, that when he looks into her eyes, he actually sees fish. We know in the New Testament it says, I'm going to take you from being fishers of men, from being fishermen to fishers of men. This bride is so in love with Jesus that the devotion of Jesus and the care of Jesus and the qualities of Jesus and the priorities of Jesus have so filled her life that even her eyes look like ponds of fish. Chapter 8. And verse 3. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. Verse 5, who is this coming up from the desert, leaning on her lover? Is it tough for you right now? You're going through economic crisis, you're going through health crisis? Then read the Song of Solomon and lean upon your lover. But the book ends like this. Jesus asks a question and says this, chapter, verse 13, you who dwell in the gardens... With friends in attendance, let me hear your voice. We've been through this whole thing. I've described you. I've called the future out of you. I've declared that you're not neglected. I've declared that you're not rejected. I've declared that you're not dark. I've declared you my darling. I've declared you my beautiful one. I've declared you flawless. I've declared you perfect. I've declared you unique. Is there somebody in the garden that will cry out to me? What will she cry? She says this, come away, my lover. And be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. The bride has learned to trust the groom and is prepared not just to sit in the shade of the cross, not just to sit in the luxury of the king's table, but to go on a journey up the mountain. God is calling us 3CI. God is calling us the rock. God is calling every person listening to maturity, that you can handle unanswered prayer, you can handle beatings and bruisings because you are so in love with Jesus. God bless you. God bless you.
God bless you. Amen. You're beautiful beyond description. Too marvelous for words. Too wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard. You are his darling. You are his rose. He has never been embarrassed about you. He will never body shame you. Your brothers, even your family, could have exposed you to the sun, but Jesus will always cover you with his shade. He will turn the greatest curse of your life, the apple tree, into the greatest blessing of your life and feed you with raisins. He is an extravagant, lavish, incredible God. He will place his left hand under your head and caress you with his right. He will kiss you in such a way, the Bible says in, in, in Song of Solomon 4, that milk and honey is under your tongue and that when you have intimacy with Christ, your inheritance and your future and the promised land will come into being in your life. Do not let the words of a man on earth define you. Do not let the words of a leader on earth define you. There's only one who will define you. He is the fearful one of Revelation. He is the rejoicing one of Romans and he is the lover of the Song of Solomon. Kiss the son lest he be angry. High five him if you want to. Fist pump him if you have to. But be intimate with the God that will make you fruitful. That will not allow you to just linger in the valleys of your life, but will pick you up and take you on an adventure up the mountains. You have not been given the spirit of fear. You have been given the spirit of sonship by which we cry, Abba, Father. He did not just die on the cross so that we can be saved and live in the shade and live at his table. He died on the cross so that we could climb mountains. Not out of any form of missional responsibility, but out of pure devotion and love to a Jesus Christ who loves us first, who cares for us, who extravagantly pours his perfume upon us, who loves us enough to blow both the north and the south wind over us who loves our sandaled feet. It's like saying, oh, my beautiful bride, you are not just so twinkle-toed that you can only handle soft, comfortable marshmallow roads, but you can actually handle roads with stones because that's where the far out live. That's where those who are untouchable live. We have to ride those roads. Oh, times there will be in the carriage of Song of Solomon 4, the golden carriage inlaid with silver with posts of gold, surrounded by 60 men. And other times we'll just journey with him in the desert over stones and tough terrain. But he is enough. Who is this coming out of the desert leaning upon their lover? I want to say me, Lord God. Who is this coming out of COVID leaning upon their lover? I want to say me, Lord God. Who is this coming out of COVID leaning upon their lover? I want to say 3CR, Lord. Who is this coming out of the desert leaning upon? I want to say the Rock Church, Lord God. We trust you, Lord God. We believe in you. Oh God, not all of our prayers have been answered, but we love you, Lord God. We want to say, Lord God, to this nation, I am lovesick with Jesus. His head is pure as gold. His authority in my life is highly valued. His hair is black as a raven. His eyes are like doves. Young ladies, listen to this. Never ever say this again. I am neglected and I am rejected. I pray today your language changes. You say this, I am the Rose of Sharon. If God can use a Portuguese businessman from Brazil to pull out of a briefcase a rose to give to a South African girl flying to Los Angeles, then you have to believe Song of Solomon, chapter 2, I am, I not will become, I am the rose of Sharon. I say happy Valentine's Day from the greatest lover in the world. His name is Jesus. Your eyes take his breath away. The Bible says your face is lovely and your voice is sweet. So start singing and start glowing. And Lord Jesus, like this book ends, I want to say, where are you, young stag? Where are you, gazelle? I want to follow you up the spice-laden mountains. I want to take 3CR Church on an adventure, Lord God, that is bigger than ourselves. 
Building a building, Lord God, is just the beginning. You want to launch people into the nations of the world. Oh Jesus, I pray it will come from a deep, romantic, passionate, garden love. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Your love is sweeter than wine. I'm my beloved and he is mine. He's called me to the banqueting table and his banner over me is love. 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 Amen.